One, go! It's one of our most basic tools, and one of the most powerful. In the hands of an expert, it can chop through 14 inches of solid wood in a matter of seconds. And no one wields an axe with more precision, speed, and cutting power than competitive lumberjacks. From the pros, to the college amateurs. The woodsman team from Paul Smith's College in upstate New York ranks among the best. Their razor-sharp axes make quick work of solid wood or anything else that gets in the way. It looks dangerous because it is. These are six pound razor blades that you're swinging right between their, your legs. More than one guy has earned the nickname Stumpy in this sport. I was at a competition one time and a guy took his uh, big toe off and we spent the next half hour all of the competitors crawling through the grass looking for his toe. Some measure of safety may be provided by a chain mail sock to prevent an ax from cutting flesh. This is actually a uh, butcher's chain mail down here. This will stop an ax, but it's not gonna stop it from breaking a bone. Competitors ready? This is your cadence. Three, two, one, go. Timber sports came straight from 19th century logging camps, where the outcome of a bet for a pint of whiskey or the duty of cleaning the outhouse balanced on the lumberjack's prowess with an ax. Serious competitors swing a serious ax, a highly specialized racing ax. While an axe at the local hardware store costs about 30 bucks, a racing axe like this can set you back up to 500 bucks. If you were to go and take a hardware store axe and come out here and try to chop this, we'd still be chopping right now and we'd probably be chopping into the night. This is the Ferrari of the axe world. Forged from high quality steel, the head is thinner than that of a traditional axe, with a longer seven and a half inch blade that's sharp enough for a close shave. That'll take your hair right off. That'll go right through a toe <laughs> or a finger. The finely tuned racing axe operates according to the same laws of physics as every axe. An axe is a classic example of the simple machine, the wedge. The head is a wedge with a thin, sharp point of contact, the cutting edge. The sharper the edge, the more efficient the axe. The racing axe epitomizes this. They're meant to cut green wood as opposed to dry wood so that the, uh, the very wet wood fibers actually explode as the blade comes into contact with it. An axe head by itself is useful. But add another simple machine, a lever in the form of a handle or a haft, and the power of the axe increases. The axe head may be the star, but the haft delivers the power. The handle is a very important component of the axe because it amplifies the power coming from the chopper to the axe head and ultimately to the block of wood. Dissecting the parts of an axe sounds like an anatomy lesson. Throat, belly, shoulder, butt, eye, cheek, beard, heel, and toe. Some people have surmised that maybe the reason that the toe is called the toe is because that's the part that it most often removes from you. Some woodsmen study biomechanics to deliver optimal power with every stroke. They found that taking the axe behind the head is wasted motion. Now, if you bring it straight down, that's good and all, but you can create more power, a greater biomechanical advantage, that is, if you throw the axe out. The most efficient chopper delivers a rolling blow. That's the whole reason that we don't present the whole bit of the axe into the wood, but instead, first, the heel, followed by the belly and then the toe. The underhand chop echoes the moves of a lumberjack bucking a fallen tree, while the standing chop resembles a lumberjack chopping down a tree. But axe throwing? This challenge is pure sport.
To double your chances of sticking the blade, a throwing axe has two sharp edges, called bits. The lumberjack throws the three-pound axe overhand, 20 feet to the target. Hitting the four-inch bullseye takes a well-balanced axe, a sharp edge, and a keen eye. There it is, bullseye. The same goes for the lumber jills. Her thumbs pointed straight up to keep the axe from over-rotating. Everything's in a perfect line, and there it is. It makes you feel kind of powerful when you're holding an axe. You're, you feel pretty darn tough, I'm not going to lie. Racing or not, modern axes are mass-produced out of steel. But how do you turn six pounds of this into one of these? In Lake Waccamaw, North Carolina, axe making is a family operation. In business since 1886, Council Tool is one of the few remaining axe makers in the United States today. The company makes about two dozen different axes, but they each start with 20-foot bars of steel. Using hydraulic machinery, they can exert 80 tons of force. Workers shear the bars into six-pound chunks. You can see where the uh, the steel moved just a little bit. That's maybe an eighth of an inch, and then it then it broke off. Shaping the axe is a process as old as blacksmithing itself. Heat it and beat it. An induction coil furnace uses a magnetic field to heat the steel pieces to more than 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. With a solid grip and some serious hearing protection, the hammer operator works the hot steel in a die under the 3,500 pound hammer. About 10 blows shapes the steel into an axe head. After trimming, the still red-hot axe head undergoes another brute force operation. A machine called an upsetter grips the head and with 280 tons of force, punches out the eye where the handle will later be attached. It's actually harder for the machine to pull the punch back out than it is to push it in because the eye is trying to cool and grab it. Once the axe head cools, craftsmen in the finishing room use belt grinders to clean its shape. Then comes the crucial moment when the bit is hardened. A small induction coil heats the bit of the axe to a little over 1,500 degrees. Then a water-based solution quenches the axe, quickly cooling it to lock hardness into only the blade. If the entire head was hardened, the thin eye section might break. Next, in another shower of sparks, a grinder operator sharpens the bit to exact specifications. Then, workers dip the axe head in water-soluble enamel that will later be baked for a durable finish. You can order any color you want, so long as it's black or red. Finally, the axe head is ready for the haft. This is a very critical step. We're joining a hickory handle to the tool head itself. The handle is dried. We keep them in a humidity-controlled room so that the material doesn't shrink and become loose. A hydraulic press fixes the head to the wooden handle. The same press pushes in a serrated aluminum wedge to lock the joint solid. How solid? Random samples are put to the test. This machine represents the blow that would be delivered by an average built 180 pound man. The contraption induces shock into the head to simulate typical use. But that's just the warm up for the so-called pull test. To test how tightly the handle is joined to the head, thousands of pounds of pressure pull on the handle. A passing grade is 1,000 pounds. This axe survived 6,000 pounds of force before the handle began to pull out of the head. Council Tool ships 10 to 20,000 axes every month. A far cry from the output of mankind's earliest axe makers in the Paleolithic age, who relied only on a stone, a piece of flint, and a steady hand. And the amazing thing about these tools is they lasted in, in the human inventory for more than a million years. 
the hand axe was primitive man's meal ticket to new sources of food. Now we could butcher that zebra and carry a leg off and eat in peace somewhere and not have to worry about something coming back to get us. And we could get into these bones because in here, of course, is the marrow. Lots of nutrition, lots of calories, lots of fat, lots of protein. And there's the marrow right there. This is the first food processor. At some point in the later part of the Stone Age, the biggest development in axes was invented, the first handle. This is a very important point. When you put a handle on an ax, then you up the ante. And you increase the efficiency, you increase, increase the power, and you turn a very important tool into a super tool. Historian Steve Watts speculates that the first half may have been made from flexible branches, such as willow, split, and bent over the stone ax head. So even as flimsy as that is, it's more efficient than holding it in my hand. Bundled with more branches and wrapped with rawhide, the hand axe transforms into a chopper. That's a super tool. Some 10,000 years ago, early man made a haft with a hole to accept the axe head. Here we're seeing the efficiency of this haft. We said before, it's not getting looser, it's getting tighter. Because every swing of the axe tightens the head. With this tool, mechanically clearing land for agriculture first became possible. This is the stone axe at its height. 5,000 years later, stone axes gave way to copper. A thousand years after that, copper gave way to bronze. Another thousand years passed before this bronze axe, crafted in the Middle East, featured new hafting technology, an eye. This means that the haft is going to be much less subject to splitting at the moment of impact. 300 years later, around 1,000 AD, the axe was in the Iron Age. This is an axe that really means business. Throughout history, blacksmiths have applied heat and hammer to shape iron into an axe. They knew that some of the metal they worked was harder. They didn't know that this prized metal was actually an alloy of iron and carbon, steel. Even as frontiersmen explored North America in the 17th century, steel was in short supply. So blacksmiths saved it for the part of the axe that needed hardness the most, the cutting edge. In some places on the frontier, steel was certainly as valuable as gold is. You need a steel axe to cut trees down, a gold one won't do you much good. To make the most of the rare metal, blacksmiths developed the skill to fold an iron billet and forge weld a piece of steel in place for the bit. With an assist from some modern tools, Blacksmith Paul Thorne creates this axe the same way a frontier blacksmith did. In a ballet of heating, hammering, and reheating, he adds the steel bit. Then shapes the pole, the back of the head. Next, he sizes the eye to accept the haft. Then a little grinding cleans up the axe and he heat treats the steel bit. We're ready to quench that edge. Once cooled and polished, the axe is ready to be hafted. And then this axe would be used probably for a lifetime. The axe has a different identity beyond that of a versatile tool. It also became an intimidating and deadly weapon. But did it give a warrior the edge he needed against a foe wielding a sword? No one knows exactly when the axe was first used as a weapon, but it wasn't a long reach to go from whacking at trees and smashing bones to using the tool for whacking and smashing rivals. An axe is all about aggression, it's all about attack, it's all about threatening your opponent. In the fifth century, as the Roman Empire was falling, Axes had a place in the arsenal of the Franks in Western Europe. This is the Francisca. You can see from the design that this is very emphatically a uh, military weapon. 
In close quarter combat, these iron axes could smash through wooden shields. Look at that. Straight through. Man's now without a shield. The next shot, that's him dead. The Francisco was also an effective and deadly throwing weapon. You can throw it at somebody to break up an organized unit and actually smash away at them, break them down. If you're lucky, if you're good, hit him in the head, hit him in the neck, break his head in two, cut it clean off. The thought of a Viking axe conjures images of a massive weapon that only a troll could wield. In reality, Viking battle axes wielded in Northern Europe in the 10th century were light, fast, and well-balanced. Eli's got the two-handed axe. He's going to take a big sweeping cut at my leg. I'm going to withdraw that target and step back. I now have a good target at his forward leg. He's going to withdraw his two-handed axe. If he catches the head of my axe, I either fall on my face or let it go. The Viking axe was as intimidating as it was lethal. The axe is very much a shock weapon, a terror weapon. It's really nasty to see this axe poised over your head and coming down for a blow because you know your shield's not going to stop it. One key to this battle axe's lethal power was the curve of the bit, the shape concentrating the force of the blow into a small section of the blade. Across Europe, the axe continued to give soldiers a literal edge in battle. Medieval knights often rode into battle armed with axes as well as swords. The stuntmen portraying knights in today's popular Medieval Times dinner and tournament shows please crowds by recreating medieval battle techniques. An axe, a knight, and a horse made a killer combination. It's just sheer brute force. If swung from a horse, the, the forward energy of the horse, which is about 25 miles an hour, and then the, the power in my arm, and then the weight of the weapon, unimaginable forces, even if you have the helmet, even if you have chain mail, even if you have armor. The ax is a menacing weapon in the right hands, carried by the right person. It's over. In a fight pitting axe versus sword, few could predict the outcome. The sword's advantage is that it's faster and lighter. I think the sword's very technical. You can use it in a lot of different ways. It's a lot more maneuverable than the axe. So in, in close combat, I would always choose the sword. But the knight who was adept with an axe held the advantage of its brute force killing power. I'd have to put my money on the axe. It's a, it's a vicious, vicious weapon. I don't think he'd stand a chance. Ultimately, it comes down not to what kind of weapon you use, but how good you are at using it. Ancient iron weapons were prone to breaking and sending pieces flying. So for the safety of bystanders and warriors alike, medieval time stuntmen use weapons made of stronger titanium. But they're still using 11th century skills at full speed. Man, it feels like it's coming 100 miles an hour. Um, it's whizzing past you, and you can hear the wind as it goes past, and it, it seems like it, it's about to cut you in half if you don't get out of the way. Knights on foot went into battle armed with aptly named pole axes. When fighting an opponent armed with a sword, their long hafts offered an advantage in reach. But their blades would be no match for the next advance in military defense, plate armor. In response, axe makers were forced to design more specialized pole axes. This took shape essentially as a kind of a lobster mallet for cracking open a knight. You've got a very stout axe blade, maybe not quite so much my blade of choice if I'm going for the armor itself. In that case, that's where the meat tenderizer hammer comes in. It's designed to have a maximum purchase on armor plate. If the bludgeoning effect of the hammer didn't work, this spike was designed for getting in between the plates of armor. The ornate bronze inlay made the point that even in medieval days, image mattered. For a knight, you also had to look the part. This is as much a status piece as it is anything else. Whoever carried this poleaxe into battle was fighting in style. 
Surviving armored combat meant using the pole axe in defense, while attacking with it to exploit the openings in an opponent's armor. From here, he's perfectly open for a thrust up under the tail of his helmet, which would end the fight. Middle Age axes were used not only in combat, but also for executions. The axes used for beheadings were not unlike those wielded on the battlefield. But the executioner's axe was so poorly balanced that it had a tendency to twist in his hands during the downward swing. If your executioner wasn't top notch, he'd need multiple strokes to sever your head. Dying by the axe was something of a privilege. If you were an ordinary commoner, you went to the hangman's rope. If you were an aristocrat, then you had the privilege of being beheaded. When colonists left the old world for the new, the axe went with them. Native Americans gave it a new name. And we keep redefining the tomahawk's limits. On the American frontier, the axe was man's best friend. A good axe, good steel, hung properly on a good hickory handle was, was the supreme tool of a woodsman. As sharp as a knife, the axe was the original multi-purpose tool. As an example, an old-time camper might, might need to make a tent peg for his tent, for his tarp at night. Sure, the axe chops, but it also shaves, shapes, and carves like a knife. And the final application of the axe is as the hammer to drive that tent peg. The axe was the best friend of not just the frontier settlers, but also the Native Americans. They had a different name for it, the tomahawk. Beginning in the 17th century, tribes acquired thousands of iron axes from European traders and adopted this iconic product of Western civilization as their own. Blacksmith Ryan Johnson has been fascinated by tomahawks since he was 10. He's an expert at hand forging detailed replicas, like this so-called spike tomahawk, an aggressive weapon with machismo flair. It's strictly a killing tool. There's, this really doesn't have much practical application for chopping wood or, or clearing brush or things like that. It's strictly something to strike with. The spikes were typically used to strike in the head um, and, and body blows with the blade. The misconception persists that tribes used tomahawks to scalp their enemies. The truth is they did that with their knives. A scalping knife had a blade more suitable for slicing, making the tomahawk the wrong tool for the job. Some tomahawks, however, did come in handy for a less grisly activity, smoking. You could put tobacco in the pipe end of the ax, and then the shaft was used for smoking. This is a mouthpiece, and you could literally smoke this uh, tomahawk. You think, well, who's the person that thought of making a pipe tomahawk that you could smoke? But it makes sense if you think about the time and the culture. The culture was a very tobacco-oriented culture, very ax-oriented culture. Most people who are out in the woods, in the field, they carried an ax, they carried a pipe. Uh, it combined two things that they were already carrying. Plus, this was a much more durable pipe than what was available. The pipe tomahawk became a coveted ceremonial item. Many Native Americans posing for photographs wouldn't have their picture taken without it. The tomahawk became such a useful, universal tool uh, that it lost its sex appeal as a weapon. But the tomahawk gained new favor as a military weapon in the 20th century. During the Vietnam War, some 4,000 American soldiers wielded updated non-standard issue tomahawks, designed by World War II combat veteran and founder of the American Tomahawk Company, Peter Lagana. Uh, the tomahawk was strictly a piece that soldiers bought on their own. The last time it was a standard issue item uh, for Army was in the War 1812. In Vietnam and subsequent conflicts, American soldiers have reportedly used such tactical tomahawks almost exclusively as tools, not weapons. Party that out. Still, the enthusiasts currently selling them to service personnel outside of government channels promote them as deadly effective, both in hand-to-hand -hand combat and as throwing weapons. In the spring of 2001, a request from a friend in the armed forces put Ryan Johnson on the path to improve the technology of the tactical tomahawk. 
He wasn't interested in a historical reproduction. What he wanted was a modern day tomahawk. He wanted a, a, a battlefield tool. The old school blacksmith turned to 21st century forging techniques to hammer out a one piece all steel tomahawk. Yeah, it's a long way from the original as far as how they're made. A 4,000 pound power hammer bangs out two tactical tomahawks at a time. As he moves across the die, the tomahawk takes shape from a round bar to a large plate with two tomahawks nested in it. Then they're punched out with a large punch run. These tomahawks are made of hardened tool steel, well suited to holding their edges. Each has a forward blade for cutting and chopping, and a spike on the rear, capable of deadly penetration. This helmet's made out of some of the toughest stuff that we have, Kevlar. It'll stop about a nine millimeter bullet, and I've just punctured it with this tomahawk. The beard of the tomahawk is also sharpened, making it lethally effective in close quarters combat. You could actually hit somebody on the side of the neck with it, this location, and then use the beard pulling it toward you to sort of rake them into you. You're also going to puncture the skin, the back of the neck, and uh, if you do it hard enough, uh, you could possibly kill somebody right away. Armed with a tomahawk, a combatant could quickly disable a vehicle by puncturing tires and smashing through windows. The can opener effect of the tactical tomahawk sharp beard brings new meaning to the term forcible entry. You look at the cutting edge, you look at the spike, you know, as much punching through as we've done, it's just not that much damage to it. Like their Vietnam era predecessors, these tomahawks aren't standard issue, but servicemen who buy them find they carry the same intimidation as they did 250 years ago. These axes are being carried in areas of the world where they're blade cultures. They're people who respect blades, uh, much more so than, than firearms. And so you're carrying something like this, it gets their attention and it gets their respect. The axe commanded respect in the forests of North America as well. Timber! Having one was essential. But if one axe was good, then a thousand axes must be great for this man. Larry McPhail of Blaine, Washington, is one of many people who still heat their homes with wood. To keep the home fires burning, he splits his own. In the past 30 years, Larry has split almost 400 cords of wood. His biggest challenge isn't drumming up the energy for the task. It's choosing which axe to use from his collection of more than 1,000. This is uh, mainly just the beginning of the axe collection. I have another room that has some more. Larry's axe collection fills two garages. The lion's share of these that I've collected were actually used by loggers. For more than a century, the axe was among the prime movers powering the American logging industry. Axe makers designed about 200 different patterns of tree felling axes, many named for the region they were made for. Notice how this axe is shaped the same on the top and the bottom. It's called a California reversible. Uh, if you turn it either way, it'd be exactly the same. This is a Michigan pattern. Notice how it's uh, flat on the top and very swooping. And this was uh, basically invented for the Michigan forest. 19th century US axe makers created models like this out of sheer necessity. Axes imported from Europe lack the balance and cutting power to bring down America's forests efficiently enough to meet the demands of the burgeoning logging industry. European axes typically had wide blades and very little mass behind the haft. Most of the weight was in front of the handle. North American axe designers built up the pole and narrowed the bit. The changes balanced the axe head over the handle adding stability when striking a blow, focusing power on the cutting edge. You don't see it in any other countries in the world, really, that has the big pole head just like this and this long, slender, single bit. Another revolutionary design element appeared around 1860, the double bit. Why two? 
To me, the most important part is they're perfectly balanced. And the other reason is they actually have two axes in one. When the one side gets dull, they can flip over and use the other side. An axe is still the favorite tool of these woodsmen, Frank Philbrick and his dad, Stephen. Their target today in Western Massachusetts is a 60-foot pine. Even though a chainsaw may be faster and more efficient, they find satisfaction in doing it the old-fashioned way. The ax, definitely more reliable than the chainsaw. Quieter, I, I would say probably safer. Slower to get into trouble than a chainsaw. Someone could just go out with a saw and, and wind up in a tough spot instantly. This at least you'd have to sweat first. And I see that that tree... Using a pendant as a plumb bob, Stephen checks the lean of the tree. They say felling is a negotiation between where you want the tree to fall and where it wants to land. 10, 12 feet? Yeah. I don't know what's... When we... There's a certain element of mystery and doubt to this, which will probably make for good TV viewing, huh? <laughs> I hope. That's it, huh? They plant a stake where they hope to bring the tree down. And Frank marks out where the first cut will be made. Bottom there. Top there. Using the same technique that lumberjacks used centuries ago, Frank and Steve will chop two carefully placed notches. The first notch, called the face cut, opens in the direction that they want the tree to fall. It will be chopped halfway through the trunk. This notch must have a 45-degree roof, a flat floor, and be large enough to avoid pinching the axe inside. On the opposite side of the tree, they'll cut the so-called felling notch, which must be higher than the first. If properly cut, the felling notch will leave a hinge that will help control and guide the tree as it falls. Nice. This little axe cuts nice. Frank wields his favorite double-bitted axe, made in Maine more than 75 years ago. These men who did this must have had absolutely prodigiously strong hands. How about a breather there? You're, yeah. You're doing huge work. And the breather's not going to be all that long before I'm worn out, so... <laughs> There you go. There you go. Now you're putting the chips on the ground. Steve now switches to a modern store-bought axe, recently added to their collection, to see how the new compares to the old. The new one. Nah, see the way it's not, yeah. it doesn't hold its line on the, on the downward yes. strokes. It won't hold the angle he's hitting it. It's, it does what's called scooping, and it's spitting yep. it out. Yeah. OK, now try with that nice and sharp. After Frank completes the face cut, he takes a moment to sharpen his ax and goes to work on the felling notch. If it's not cut right, the butt of the tree might shoot backward as it falls and injure or kill the woodsman. Three tons of tree will soon come crashing down. It's exciting, it's productive, it's dangerous, and there's just about a 10% of we just don't know. There we go. Timber! Timber! Yeah! Oh, that was great. Yeah. That's satisfying. <laughs> That's why everybody shouts timber. It's, it's honestly that, that didn't take as long as I thought it was going to. Yeah. How about that target? See if <laughs> Not bad. Not bad at all, Lefty. Close enough. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. For centuries, axes not only brought down forests, but also shaped logs into timber for construction. In Monroe, Georgia, the Holder brothers, Witt and Gable use RetroTap to make beams for building timber frame structures. This log is destined to replace a beam in a historical building, so the work requires historical accuracy. 
That means they rely on axes, and only axes, just like traditional hewing experts of centuries past. The brothers make the first cuts with felling axes. This is called juggling, this whole process. The sections in between the notches are called juggles, and the next stage will be to split those off. The whole purpose is so that we're removing a lot of wood at once, each of these juggles. They score the log. Then to cut a flat surface, they use an ax with a bent head. This ax is a, a Swedish broad ax. The handle is straight, but the head is turned at an angle. The blade is parallel to the work, but my hands are safely away from the log. They use the broad ax to smooth the timber, leaving behind the distinctive pattern of hand-hewn wood that no modern techniques can duplicate. The Holder brothers base their work on their own forensic examination of old timbers to figure out exactly how logs were hewn hundreds of years ago. Think of it as hewing CSI. There's a lot of legends and myth, but the tool marks tell the tale. And when you can interpret them, then it's not guesswork, and, and we can actually know how they did it. The axe may have helped build homes and build lives on the frontier. But today, it's the tool for saving lives in an emergency. No axe may be more iconic than the one in the hands of a firefighter. Every firefighter who graduates from the Los Angeles Fire Training Academy carries one. If I get off the rig, I don't have it, I almost feel naked without it. So it's, uh, it's a part of me. The fire axe showcases its indispensability in this training exercise. It's tailor-made to break into burning buildings. And cut ventilation holes in roofs. Even when firefighters have power tools at their disposal, they know that simpler can often be better. Chainsaws uh, might stall, but this is always going to work. It doesn't require any gas. It doesn't require any uh, extraordinary maintenance and it's uh, easy to use and user-friendly. Most important of all, the firefighter's axe is a lifesaver. Many firefighters have rescued themselves and others by smashing through walls to create an escape route. I would have been dead. Well, I'm here today because I had my axe with me. Captain Carlos Garcia's close call came in 1998 when he became trapped in a burning building and fell back on basic training, pulled my axe off my side and started going through the wall. Garcia finally succeeded, allowing other firefighters to locate and rescue him. Without that axe, I would have never got through that wall. Every single day I strap this on when we go to a fire and I make sure it's with me. The fire axe is the fusion of two tools. It features the spike of a picaroon, a logging tool, and the blade of a flat-headed axe. The blade makes quick work of slicing through composite wood or thick roof planking. The spike is perfect for grabbing and ripping. It's also handy for gaining a foothold on a steep roof. Now he's got something to work off of. And it makes a life-saving emergency break. In case I go to step, and, I, and I, I step and I slip, well, now I can hang off here, and they can bring a ladder to me. Although axes can get firefighters out of a lot of trouble, they aren't indestructible. Their Achilles heel, the wood handle. It's the worst thing to have happen to a firefighter. They try and use their axe, and all of a sudden, they break the handle off the head, and they're useless. To be honest, I broke my last axe that was a wood handle. I've gone through three axes. Fiberglass handles offer the solution. The Nucla Company in Los Angeles makes fiberglass handles for one popular model of the firefighter's axe. Making a fiberglass handle begins with up to 150 bales of fiberglass. 
Each bale contains more than 100 strands. The strands undergo a process called poltrusion. It's pulled through the channels down toward the resin. The glass then proceeds into the dye. The dye compresses the glass. The dye heats the resin-coated strands to 300 degrees, speeding the curing process. Then the glass meets the tractor that puts the pull in poltrusion. And it'll travel 30 feet down to our cutter. And that's how we make a fiberglass handle. Nupla periodically tests handles in this screw-driven machine that can deliver 12,000 pounds of pulling pressure. First, a new hardware store acts with a wood handle. It splinters with 244 pounds of pull on the handle. This handle broke and it leaves a very sharp piece at this end, and the tool end itself is also very dangerous to be around. Next, a fiberglass handle. The fiberglass handle gives way at 571 pounds, more than twice the load that destroyed the wood handle. The bottom line, fire axes with fiberglass handles almost never break lending the firefighter's best tool a potent new dimension. Count this among the many ways the ax, in all its incarnations, will always be cutting edge. Whether it's used as a tool in the hands of Paul Bunyan, clearing a forest. Timber! Or it's a weapon in the hands of a medieval knight winning himself a name on the field of battle. It's all about personal empowerment. The axe is really all about